I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are taking a look back at this year in psychopharmacology. We're going to look back at the year 21 to discuss advancements, FDA approvals, and all research addressing mental health. And I have the pleasure of interviewing NEI's Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Andrew Cutler. Welcome. Well, thank you, Sabrina. It's great to be here. Boy, I'll tell you, every year we say it's a big year, but 2021 really was an incredible year for psychopharmacology. Absolutely. Absolutely. So with that, I'll start with my first question for you, which is, what are some of the new FDA approvals for medications that happened this year? Well, there were several approved that I think are important to know about. Let's start with ADHD, since it's uh, kind of alphabetically with an A. There were two medications approved this year. The first one was an interesting novel stimulant formulation. So, you know, we've had a pro-drug version of amphetamines, which is Listex amphetamine. Well, finally, we now have a pro-drug of methylphenidate. And this drug is called as Staris, A-Z-S-T-A-R-Y-S. And it's actually two medications together. The main story here is surdexmethylphenidate, which is a prodrug version of demethylphenidate. So it's the prodrug version, and it's not active until it's absorbed by the lower intestinal tract and converted to demethylphenidate through an enzymatic process. Now, mm-hmm. there is a little bit of a delay in the onset of action here. So what they did was they formulated it with about 30% of immediate release demethylphenidate, and the other 70% is the surdexmethylphenidate. And that gives it early onset of efficacy and a sustained release. And proud to say I was an investigator on the pivotal trial, the classroom study that got this drug approved, the laboratory classroom study. And I'm an author on uh, posters that have been presented and the manuscript that will be published soon for for this. And what I can tell you that's really interesting is this prodrug surdex methylphenidate by itself was found to have a lower abuse liability. And so the FDA actually descheduled it from a Schedule 2, which is all the other stimulants, down to a Schedule 4. So this product itself is still Schedule 2 because of the immediate release demethylphenidate component. However, the company (laughs) may eventually look at releasing surdex methylphenidone by itself And it would be a Schedule 4 stimulant, which would be incredible. I think that even this combination might be appropriate for adolescents or college students who might be more at risk for abuse and diversion because it may have a little less abuse liability being 70% of the pro-drug. Now, the other medication approved for ADHD is also very exciting to me because it's a non-stimulant and it is an extended release version of veloxazine and it's and it's veloxazine er and the brand name is kelbre which is a strange name it's q e l b r e e there's no u in there it's not quelbre it's kelbre mm-hmm. now veloxazine is, has an interesting history it was approved as a very effective antidepressant medication in europe for over 20 years the problem was it had a short half life and it was given 3 times a day and had some nausea with it What happened was the company that was promoting it eventually pulled it off the market for commercial reasons because SSRIs came around, which were once a day and well tolerated, and and it had nothing to do with safety or efficacy concerns of of veloxacy. Anyway, uh, Supernus, which is a company that makes extended release formulations of medications, they and licensed this, made an extended release once a day version and got it approved in uh, children and adolescents for ADHD it was actually approved April 2nd, the day after April Fool's Day this year, 2021. <laughs> and again, uh, I have to say I was very involved with the development of this, including the pivotal trials. I'm an author on uh, papers, posters of the various studies. I'm really excited about this. The way uh, Kelbury works, Loxazine works, is it is it does have some norepinephrine reuptake inhibition properties, which is similar to atomoxetine. However, what it also does is it increases 
levels of serotonin in parts of the brain. And, and, and it accomplishes this, we think, by binding to some specific serotonin receptors. It's not an SNRI. It's not a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, but it binds to serotonin receptors, and especially a 5-HT2B where it's an antagonist, and that may be part of the antidepressant story, increased serotonin release. 5-HT2C where it, it, it's reputed to be an agonist. And usually we think of 5-HT2C antagonism as being an antidepressant, but maybe some desensitization of the receptor or something like that. Also, it's a 5-HT7 antagonist, and we know from some other medications on the market, including vortioxetine and lorazidone, that 5-HT7 antagonism can be antidepressant, pro-cognitive, and helps mm-hmm. the wake cycle. Mm-hmm. So all of these properties together, a, an effective medication, not only for depression, but it's also been proven to work for ADHD. As I mentioned, its initial approval in April of this year was for children and adolescents up to age 17. However, they also have successful data for adults, and they filed for the adult approval. And the PDUFA date, the date the FDA will rule on the approval, is actually April of 2023. Uh, sorry, 2022, okay. this coming year. I got my years mixed up. So that, that's also very exciting. Other medications now, if we switch to other fields of medicine, there was a very controversial approval of a drug for Alzheimer's called aducanumab or aduhelm. This is a monoclonal antibody against amyloids and has been shown to clear amyloid out of the brain, beta amyloid in particular. Mm -hmm. And so the thinking is that by clearing out amyloid, which is probably toxic to the brain, it may improve cognition. And there was some efficacy data. It was really kind of not overwhelming, however. And on my birthday this year, actually on June 7th, 2021, it was approved. And it's potentially Mm -hmm. the first disease modifying agent. The other agents approved the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and memantine Mm -hmm. really kind of slow the decline, but don't really modulate the disease process itself. The fast track approval has met with a lot of controversy because it's not clear that clearing out amyloid, amyloid may be the final common pathway, may be very late in the disease process. And so clearing out amyloid is fine, but it may be too late. The horse may be already out of the barn. And again, as I mentioned, the efficacy data was, you know, was not overwhelming. Also, it's going to be a very expensive drug. And so the question is, does the cost, you know, justify the modest benefit? So, you know, politically, it was very interesting when the FDA approved this drug. I think the issue is that there is such need and such demand for an Alzheimer's treatment that the mm-hmm. FDA was kind of willing to, you know, lean on the side of approving uh, this right. drug, even though uh, the efficacy wasn't overwhelming, as I mentioned, there are right. very interesting. There are a number of really interesting mechanism of action drugs being studied for Alzheimer's disease that are that go far beyond beta amyloid. And the other area that's been studied a lot is tau anti tau drug, you know, which can lead to uh, neurofibrillary tangles, amyloid is plaques and tangles. So we'll see. We'll see. I think the mm-hmm. Alzheimer's space is an area to watch for. As far as schizophrenia, there are a couple of new medications here. First is an atypical antipsychotic with less risk of weight gain. This is called Labalfi from Alkermes. It's a combination of olanzapine, our old friend Zyprexa, and a drug called Samidorphin, which is a mu opioid receptor antagonist. The combination appears to blunt the weight gain seen with olanzapine alone. And in uh, two clinical studies, Enlighten 1 and Enlighten 2, Enlighten 1 was done to show that adding samidorphan did not diminish the efficacy, the antipsychotic efficacy of when added to Zyprexa. And Enlighten 2 looked at weight gain of patients on olanzapine alone versus those on the combination. And what was found was there was significantly less weight gain with the combination than the olanzapine alone. It didn't completely get rid of the risk of weight gain, but it significantly attenuated it. And so based on that, the FDA has approved it. Now, interestingly, their studies, their two studies were done in patients with schizophrenia, but it is actually approved with the exact same approvals as Zyprexa for both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, bipolar mania and maintenance. Mm-hmm. So I think this is going to be very interesting as our friend Les Citrome, who's an NEI faculty member, says this mm-hmm. could potentially make olanzapine great again. So <laughs> he wants to get a red hat with MOGA instead of MAGA on it. 
That's okay. Great. So, so this is certainly exciting. And then the other interesting development is in the uh, LAI space, long acting injectable space. The FDA approved a, an LAI with only a six month injection interval. So you only have to take it twice a year. And this is an ex, a, a long acting injectable version of paliperidone, a paliperidone palmitate. And of course, paliperidone palmitate we have as in Vega Sistena and in Vega Trinza, which is a three month, but the new one is called in Vega, wait for it, half year, H A F Y E R A, which I don't know how they got that name approved, but half a year, I guess, half year. Mm-hmm. So I think this could be a, a terrific addition to our options for the treatment of schizophrenia in really stable patients, only having to come back twice a year. Mm-hmm. Now, with half year, patients do need to be treated with either in Vegas Stena first for four months or with the Trinza for one three-month dosing cycle. You don't just start with half year right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as other, other treatments, there was a medication approved to treat idiopathic hypersomnia. And this is very exciting because this is the first treatment that's approved for adults with idiopathic hypersomnia. This right. is a condition where patients have chronic excessive daytime sleepiness, sleep inertia, prolonged but non-restorative sleep with napping, and cognitive impairment. And the, the medication approved is called Zywave, Z-Y-W-A-V. Now, Zywave was previously approved, I believe last year, to treat cataplexy and excessive daytime sleepiness associated with narcolepsy. Now, this is Oxybate, and so is Zyrem. And this is the difference between Zyrem and Zywave is the new one, Zywave, is a low-sodium version. These are both solutions. Zyrem has a very high sodium content, and there's warnings about that, especially for people with high blood pressure. So Zywave is a low-sodium version, and so certainly a safer version, we think. And it was found to uh, significantly improve scores on the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, the PGI, Patient Global Impression of Change, and the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale in a phase three study. And it was, it's given typically once or twice nightly. You have to give it once and then sometimes a few, couple hours later, a few hours later, you give the second one. It was generally well tolerated. There were some side effects, including nausea, headache, dizziness, anxiety, insomnia, decreased appetite, and hyperhidrosis, the sweating, and some others. But it is certainly a good option for 37, the estimated 37,000 patients with idiopathic hypersomnia in the U.S. And I went to a terrific lecture on various sleep disorders at U.S. Psych Congress this year. Right. And I didn't realize the, all the different types of sleep disorders and how you can differentiate obstructive sleep apnea, for instance, from narcolepsy, from idiopathic hypersomnia. So... Very interesting and important development from that field. Mm -hmm. I want to mention one other medication which wasn't approved specifically for a psychiatric indication, but it may be something we want to consider using. And it is something that's being studied for psychiatric conditions. Let me explain. This Mm -hmm. drug is called Wegovy, W-E-G-O-V-Y, which is semaglutide. It's a subcutaneous injection form of semaglutide which is a GLP-1 agonist. That's a glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. Now, semaglutide is FDA approved in two various forms for the treatment of diabetes. One is called Ozempic, which is also a semaglutide subcutaneous injection. The other is called Rebelsis, which is an oral version of semaglutide. Now, why is this important? Well, Wigovi was approved not for diabetes, but it was approved in June of this year for chronic weight management in patients with obesity or overweight with at least one weight-related condition like hypertension, diabetes, or lipid dysregulation. And the reason this is important is a lot of our patients, of course, have these issues. And we may consider using the GLP-1 agents. Certainly, they've been looked at to uh, help with patients who gain weight on atypicals or have metabolic issues with atypicals. But furthermore, our friend Roger McIntyre, another NEI faculty member, is studying semaglutide as a potential antidepressant medication. The brain is loaded with insulin receptors. And mm-hmm. you know, we think that insulin dysregulation could be underlying the pathology of depression in some patients. Also, it's been shown to be involved with the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So that's another mm-hmm. interesting area. 
Wow. So those are just some of the medications that have been approved this year. And there, there are a number of others that are in development that I think are very exciting. And we can talk about that a little later if we have time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow, there's so much there with just brand new medications yeah. approved. And my next question is, what about FDA approvals for devices and therapeutic approaches? Yeah, you know, this is another area of really exciting development and technologic innovation. So wh- mm-hmm. when we're talking about this area, we're talking about potentially two different things. We're talking about devices and we're talking about things like software, something that's called prescription digital therapeutics, so the concept of digital therapeutics. Mm-hmm. So first, if we talk about devices, the, a specific TMS device, transcranial magnetic stimulation, it, it turns out the brain sway deep TMS system got expanded up approval by the FDA or labeling by the FDA. It's, of course, approved to treat depression, but now it got approved to treat comorbid anxiety symptoms in patients with depression, also known as anxious depression. As part of the indication, patients have to have failed uh, to achieve satisfactory improvement from antidepressant medication treatment in the current depression episode. Mm-hmm. But turns out there were 11 different studies, 573 total patients. That's a lot of patients showing consistent and robust declines in anxiety in patients with MDD. Wow. And the, the effect sizes ranged from 0.34 to 0.9, which is really good effect sizes. When you talk about antidepressant medications, you usually have an effect size of around 0.3. So this is certainly quite interesting. So, you know, that's, it's interesting that the, the uses for TMS kind of keep expanding and growing <laughs> beyond just mm-hmm. depression. It's also being looked at for PTSD, even ADHD and other conditions. So we'll see. Now, there's another device that has been authorized by the FDA, and this is a device for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. This is a daytime electrical stimulation device. The device is called Excite OSA. E-X-C-I-T-E-O-S-A. And what it does is it strengthens tongue muscles through electrical stimulation. Mm-hmm. And, comes, and, and so it's what you can use. You use the device for 20 minutes once a day over a six-week period and then once weekly afterwards. doesn't sound like a lot, but the approval was based on 115 patients with snoring, including 48 with comorbid snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, where the device was used, as I described, and discontinued for two weeks. Overall, percent of time spent snoring at levels louder than 40 decibels was reduced by more than 20% in 87 of 115 patients. So it appears that it's cleared for use both for snoring and for obstructive sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. And it is recommended that patients get a comprehensive dental examination prior to use of the device. So very interesting. There are a number of prescription digital therapies or so-called software therapies that are in development. Last year, you know, we had the FDA clearance of two different ones for uh, ADHD. Mm -hmm. Achille Interactive has one called Endeavor RX, and Attentive has one called Skyler's Run, and these are both uh, available in the market now. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's a company called Pair Therapeutics that, from what I understand, there's six prescription digital therapies on the market, and Pair Therapeutics has three of them, so they have 50% Mm -hmm. of the market. But they're also developing these treatments for other conditions including major depressive disorders. So keep your, keep your eyes peeled to this space. Excellent. My next question is, what did we learn about the association between depression and stroke from some of the research findings this past year? What can you well, share? I'll tell you, this year there were a number of really interesting research findings in the field of, of psychiatry. Mm-hmm. And you know, to be honest, the relationship between stroke and depression is not new. I remember learning about it in my residency, which was a long time ago. I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but many <laughs> years ago. And so there's a classic association. And, and classically, what we're told is one out, of, one out of three adults have depression the first year following a stroke. So about a third of patients. Uh, there is evidence that supports the use of antidepressants. There was a classic study that was done in patients with post-stroke depression by someone named Robinson, and there have been others that have shown the efficacy of antidepressants in post-stroke depression. But a recent study, which was double-blind placebo-controlled, was taken was done to see if 20 milligrams of fluoxetine versus placebo reduced the proportion of people affected by depression after a stroke. So that basically 
giving either fluoxetine or placebo to a bunch of patients who'd had a stroke, whether or not they had depression as a prophylaxis, basically, to prevent uh, depression. Mm -hmm. And this was a big study, 614 patients on the fluoxetine group versus 607 on placebo. And they took it for 26 weeks after, excuse me, a stroke. The idea was to start two to 15 days after having the stroke. Mm -hmm. And it turned out there were, unfortunately, no significant differences in depression scores. They used the PHQ-9 in the Prozac group, fluoxetine Mm -hmm. group versus placebo. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, we can't recommend routine daily use of an antidepressant in all patients after having a stroke. It would have been very helpful had it shown a decreased risk. But for now, we recommend antidepressants once somebody has uh, shown symptoms of depression after Mm -hmm. the stroke. Mm-hmm. So that was the big finding. Wow, it's so interesting. The next question I have is, can you share with us some interesting findings from a head-to-head comparison study of clozapine, olanzapine, and haloperidol in the treatment of violent schizophrenia patients with and without conduct disorder? Okay, well, that was a mouthful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, it turns out our friend uh, Jonathan Meyer will be very happy to see the results of this study. He, of course, has published the authoritative and definitive handbook on the use of clozapine. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a study that's, I think, very clinically relevant. As we know, there are some patients with schizophrenia who are prone to violence. I I don't want to scare anybody. Overall, on average, patients with schizophrenia who are treated with the medication are not more violent than the general population. As a matter of fact, they're more likely to be the victim of violence than the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. When they're off medication, there is a slightly increased risk. Mm -hmm. However, there are some who are still prone, more prone to violence than others. And so we know that antipsychotic medication can help. But this was a study, it was a head-to-head comparison of clozapine, olanzapine, and haloperidol. This is in the treatment of patients with schizophrenia who were prone to violence with or without conduct disorder that had been diagnosed before the age of 15. Mm -hmm. Patients who had a history of being physically assaulted, assaultive were randomly assigned again to clozapine, olanzapine, or haloperidol. It was a 12 week double blind trial. They were categorized based on the presence or absence of the diagnosis of conduct disorder prior to 15 years old. What they found was that patients with conduct disorder had more frequent and severe assaults compared to those without conduct disorder during the 12-week trial. Clozapine was superior to both haloperidol and olanzapine in reducing the number of assaults, particularly in those higher-risk patients with a history of conduct disorder. Clozapine was four times more likely than haloperidol to lower violence in patients with conduct, history of conduct disorder and mm-hmm. three times more likely to lower violence in the patients without a history of conduct disorder. Now, olanzapine was superior to haloperidol in reducing assaults, particularly, again, in those with conduct disorder, but clozapine was superior to olanzapine. So what this suggests is that clozapine should really be the treatment of choice for patients with schizophrenia and violence, especially those with a history of conduct disorder. So mm-hmm. the clear answer was clozapine was the winner. Wow. Wow. That's so fascinating. What did we learn about the risk of depression in patients with traumatic brain injury? Okay. So we talked about depression and stroke. It turns out patients with uh, traumatic brain injury is, are, are also very prone to depression, as we may know. Mm-hmm. And there was a study that was done. This was a study in Denmark. And, you know, the Scandinavian countries keep tremendous records. So we see a lot of great studies, Mm -hmm. epidemiologic studies that come out from Denmark and Sweden. Well, this one was a national registry-based cohort study looking Mm -hmm. at rates of depression in people who had traumatic brain injury. And this was a a long period between 1977 and 2015. And it was almost half a million patients. And this was these people were then compared to a sex and age match reference population who did not have a history of TBI. During the follow-up period, 5.6% of people with TBI versus 3% of the reference population had depression. 
So TBI was associated with 16.6 more cases of depression per 10,000 person years. Patients with first-time TBI was associated with a higher risk of depression in both men and women, and the hazard ratios were about two, time, about two so you're quite a bit higher risk here. <laughs> a significant dose-dependent association between the number of traumatic brain injury episodes and depression was also seen. And here's the bottom line. The current mm -hmm. study found that TBI was associated with a 66 to 73% higher risk of depression. Wow. This risk was highest during the first six months after <laughs> TBI, but persisted more than a year after. Wow. This shows also the dose-dependent association between TBI and depression. So the more episodes of TBI, the higher the risk of depression. Mm -hmm. And this is critically important for clinicians who see patients with traumatic brain injury I right. used to uh, work with professional athletes, and a lot of them have had TBI, and I certainly mm -hmm. see a lot of depression in those. So bottom line again, traumatic brain injury was associated with a 66 to 73% higher risk wow. of depression. That's a very significant yeah. risk multiplier. Yeah, absolutely. So let's change topics here just a little bit. When it comes to addiction and substance use disorders, can you share some interesting findings from some of the studies that have been conducted in this past year? My next question is, which medication has the potential to be a pharmacological treatment for methamphetamine use disorder that yeah. is not likely to have been considered before? <laughs> okay, great. Well, it comes as no surprise to anyone listening that the incidence of substance use and particularly unintentional overdose deaths has climbed dramatically during the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. We were already noticing an, a, a really seismic increase in unintentional overdose deaths before COVID and, and the use of some of these high potency medications. But really during COVID, it, it has skyrocketed. Yeah. Data from pre-COVID show that from 2015 to 2019, the number of overdose deaths from psychostimulants, other than cocaine, so especially if we focus on methamphetamines, increased by 180%. So wow. in a particular study, looking at nearly 200,000 people aged 18 to 64, this study looked to uncover some of the factors associated with this increased risk of deaths. And what they found was not only this increase in overdose deaths, but just increase in general in psychostimulant use, mm -hmm. both with and without co-occurring opioid or cocaine use. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of people actually use more than one substance. They'll use kind of whatever they can get their hands on. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. what they found was that especially people injecting the substance, which is interesting because I always thought of oral and snorting, but also injecting. Right, um, right. Frequent use increased substantially, and some of the correlates of increased use included homosexual males, American Indian, Alaskan, Native, Hispanic, and white individuals versus black or uh, African American individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lower educational level, high school or lower education level, lower household income, less than $20,000, people who did not have private insurance, so public insurance or no insurance, history of hepatitis, past in the past year being on probation or parole. Mm -hmm. History of suicidal ideation in the past year, that one surprised me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Nicotine dependence, cannabis use, cocaine use, hallucinogen use, opioid use, and prescription stimulant use. So again, polysubstance use. And mm -hmm. the, the authors concluded that the increase in overdose deaths involving stimulants, psychostimulants was associated with riskier patterns of use, <clears throat> such as injection, or use with opioids rather than uh, simply methamphetamine use per se. So this is really helpful in understanding what's going on. Now, if we add to that part of the issue with the skyrocketing overdose with COVID-19 has been the fact that we've had more isolation. We've had more people with financial stress and losing jobs, less structure, less social interaction, harder to get to maybe treatment facilities and get the treatment or the help and support they might need. And mm -hmm. also something else interesting, what's been shown is that more and more methamphetamines have been cut. In other words, impurities have been added, including fentanyl. Fentanyl is cheap, but fentanyl is super potent. It's one of the highest right. potency opioid agents. And so right. people are now getting fentanyl. And so that, that has caused deaths. So. Right. 
quite surprising. Now, as far as opioid use, there was a study that was done with gabapentin, obviously we think of for anxiety and seizures and other conditions. And gabapentin blocks calcium channels that have the alpha-2 delta-1 subunit and mm-hmm. may improve both glutamatergic and GABAergic neurotransmission. Alcohol also affects glutamine and GABA neurotransmission, but agabapentin is approved for uh, certain pain conditions, neuralgia, also partial seizures, restless leg syndrome. Mm-hmm. But it was also looked at for mitigating withdrawal and preventing relapse in alcohol use disorder. So in this particular study, it's interesting, they did brain imaging, and th- this was 96 patients who were given agabapentin 1,200 milligrams per day, which some people would say is a relatively low dose, or placebo, mm-hmm. after 72 or more hours of alcohol abstinence. And then the imaging was done prior to treatment and again 14 days later. Now, what was interesting was patients taking gabapentin were significantly more likely to remain abstinent over the 16-week study period. Imaging revealed that patients taking gabapentin who remained abstinent on the majority of days also had significantly greater increases in glutamate between scans compared to placebo. Patients also had greater decreases in GABA between scans. And Mm -hmm. so the increases in glutamate correlated with the percent of days abstinent. So together, the data suggests that gabapentin may promote abstinence from alcohol by normalizing glutamatergic and GABAergic systems. Mm -hmm. And so this is really important finding. Uh, People haven't really thought about using gabapentin in this form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, there was a study uh, switching gears to opioid use disorder, and then I'm going to come back to the question you asked about methamphetamine. I'm kind Mm -hmm. of, I'm kind of keeping that as the surprise here. (laughs) Opioid use disorder also has been increasing dramatically, as we mentioned, and and unfortunately, people are using higher and higher potency medication. And what people use typically for this is medication-assisted therapies, where you're treated with an opioid agonist, a long-acting opioid agonist, typically such as methadone or um, some other uh, partial agonist, a partial antagonist, uh, which really acts as an agonist such as buprenorphine or an antagonist such as naltrexone mm-hmm. or vitrol. Outside the USA, in Germany and Austria, for instance, there's another opioid agonist called slow-release oral morphine, SROM. And a study was done looking at how efficacious uh, SROM, slow-release oral morphine, is. And what they found was significant efficacy of the medication. And also it was well tolerated. So the data supported the use of SROM as an effective and tolerable medication assisted therapy for opioid use disorders. Mm -hmm. So that may eventually be something that'll come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get to your question about methamphetamine. Unlike with opioid use disorder, there are no, and, and alcohol use disorder, there's no currently approved pharmacologic treatment or medication assisted therapy. Treatment is, tends to be psychosocial and, and non-pharmacological, and it's had a pretty limited success rate. Right, right. So there was a study done, placebo-controlled 40 individuals with meth use disorder, <clears throat> looking at the mu opioid receptor partial agonist, buprenorphine, mm-hmm. which actually I said was a partial antagonist. That's wrong. It's a partial agonist. <laughs> right. Earlier, it's a partial agonist uh, on several aspects of methamphetamine use. And when given with psychosocial therapy, people were treated with either buprenorphine or placebo for six weeks, and then they were followed up for four months. Patients given four milligrams a day of buprenorphine showed a reduced frequency of methamphetamine use, reduced craving for methamphetamine, and reduced scores of depression, anxiety, and stress compared to placebo. Wow. So this is a really interesting finding because you're talking about methamphetamine, not an opioid agent. And an mm-hmm. opioid modulator, opioid receptor modulator here has promise. Now, mm-hmm. I have to tell you about something else that's really interesting. There is actually an injection being developed of an antibody against methamphetamine, a monoclonal antibody specifically directed at methamphetamine, which has also shown a lot of promise for the treatment of methamphetamine use and also for people who have acutely overdosed on methamphetamine. You can give this injection, it immediately, the antibodies immediately bind to methamphetamine and prevent the effects. So wow. this might be something analogous to the use of injected naltrexone or Vivitrol for opioid use or alcohol use disorders. That one is also in development. 
Wow. Some really exciting, interesting developments. Yeah, absolutely. So my next question is, in a recent meta-analysis, what was reported about the association between attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, and the risk of psychosis? Wow. Now, you wouldn't think that there's an association here, Mm -mm. but it turns out there is. And Mm -hmm. I think I understand why. Let me explain. Okay. First of all, in a recent meta-analysis of 12 studies with almost 2 million participants, 1.85 million participants, an increased risk of psychotic disorder was associated with a diagnosis of ADHD during childhood compared to those without ADHD during childhood. Mm -hmm. So this is a little concerning, obviously. And I think what's potentially going on here is a lot of patients with schizophrenia are diagnosed with ADHD in childhood, and the prodrome of schizophrenia can look like ADHD. These people have trouble with attention and attentiveness. They can be fidgety. They can be impulsive. And so the question is, is this true ADHD or is this the form of Frust or the the prodrome of schizophrenia? Mm -hmm. So it's not clear yet, obviously, if there's truly a, a causal effect that someone with ADHD develop, can develop schizophrenia or if this is really schizophrenia that looks like ADHD. That's just not clear at this point. Okay. So clearly more research needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did we learn about the association between ADHD and Alzheimer's disease from a nationwide cohort study that was conducted this year? Yeah, this is one also that needs to probably be taken with a grain of salt. The take-home message is, there was an association shown between ADHD and Alzheimer's dementia. We don't know if that's a cause and effect kind of thing or what's going on exactly, but let me go over the study here. Again, this was in Sweden. So again, a Scandinavian country with tremendous record keeping. So this is a nationwide cohort study. And it was really looking at the association across generations. A different study had shown an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's in people with ADHD. This one was looking at the risk of Alzheimer's in relatives of patients with ADHD. So basically, this was incredible. This is over 4 million people. Mm -hmm. And they looked at, sorry, it's actually more than that. It was 4 million index person parent pairs, 4 million patients with ADHD and their parent, obviously 50% shared genes. Seven and a half million index person grandparent pairs, which is, of course, sharing a quarter of the genes, and almost two million, 1.8 million pairs with a patient and an uncle or an aunt. And that's, again, a 25% shared genes. So uh, among this population, there was a 3.2% incidence of being diagnosed with ADHD, which is a lot lower than most estimates around the world. And it could just be that these were the people who were diagnosed. It's probably underdiagnosed. Anyway, parents of people with ADHD had an increased risk of Alzheimer's, and the hazard ratio was 1.55, so 50% increased risk. Mm -hmm. The association with grandparents was a little less, but still significant at 1.11, so an 11% increased risk. And the association with aunts and uncles was also about 1.15, or about a 15% increased risk. Okay. So uh, that was for Alzheimer's, and a similar pattern was shown for any dementia in relatives. The risk of having early-onset Alzheimer's in parents and grandparents uh, of persons with ADHD was also higher than the risk of having late-onset Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. disease. So this is concerning. Mm -hmm. Altogether, Mm -hmm. what this suggests is that relatives of individuals with ADHD have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's or any dementia and that the association tends to attenuate with decreasing genetic relatedness. So we don't know if this is a genetic association or some other, some other risk mm-hmm. factor that may be going on here, but uh, a lot of research, I can tell you, is being done to look at this relationship because this finding has been shown, and as I mentioned in an earlier study, there was an increased risk of a person with Alzheimer's subsequently developing, uh, sorry, a person with ADHD subsequently developing Alzheimer's disease. Right, right. Wow. 
Well, it'll be interesting to see what future studies find related to that. Well, it's really interesting that a lot of our disorders are showing these interesting relationships, shared mm-hmm. genetics, things like that. I mean, mm-hmm. we certainly know about the relationship between schizophrenia and bipolar mm-hmm. disorder right, right. and depression and anxiety, right, right. PTSD and others. We, we, we've known about some of these relationships. Mm-hmm. Another in- interesting relationship is ADHD and autism. There's clearly a higher risk, kind of bidirectional risk. We know that about a third of patients with autism also meet criteria for ADHD. Mm -hmm. And there was a recent imaging study done, actually, that uh, we didn't um, necessarily have in our prepared questions, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. There was a recent imaging study done that showed that there are different neural signatures on imaging between patients with ADHD alone, those with autism alone, and those with ADHD and autism. And what happens is you have a certain neural signature with ADHD and a a different neural signature for people with autism alone. But those who have both have an overlap. They have elements of the neural pattern of both. There probably are also some patients who have shared genetics. So this is very interesting, these associations that we're finding. Again, we don't know how much is shared genetics. We're talking about shared mechanisms, uh, 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 pathophysiologies, Mm -hmm. the way that certain Mm -hmm. circuits are affected and things like that. So Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. area of a yeah. lot of research. Wow. What were the research findings from a small randomized controlled trial that examined the effects of repeated ketamine on post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD? Well, this is another area of real excitement because PTSD has also been on the rise, obviously due to um, the various wars that we've been uh, involved with for the past 20 years. And There are very few effective treatments for PTSD. As a matter of fact, there's only two medications FDA approved to treat PTSD. They are are two two different SSRIs that really have really limited kind of efficacy. Uh, There are various medications being studied, including an atypical antipsychotic, Rexpiprazole, which is showing some promise. Mm -hmm. But there is data that ketamine has a very powerful effect on the symptoms of PTSD. And previous studies looked at single IV ketamine infusions showed a significant and rapid reduction in PTSD symptoms. But in this recent controlled trial that you mentioned, repeated administration of ketamine infusions was tested. So Mm -hmm. there were 30 patients, a small number. They were randomly assigned to get six infusions of ketamine at the dose that's usually recommended, which is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, versus, interestingly, not placebo, but midazolam, which is a short-acting benzodiazepine at 0.045 milligrams per kilogram. And this was mm-hmm. considered a psychoactive placebo control or psychoactive control because obviously with ketamine, you get some kind of a dissociative effect. So if you give placebo, it's pretty clear you're not getting active drugs. So they wanted to give something that would have some kind of psychomimetic effects. Mm-hmm. And this was given over two consecutive weeks, so six infusions, three per week, over two weeks. Assessments were made 24 hours after the first infusion and at weekly visits. Primary outcome is a uh, rating scale that's really the gold standard for PTSD. It's called the CAPS-5, the Clinician Administered PTS Scale Mm -hmm. for Mm DSM-5. And uh, the uh, primary outcome was two weeks after completion of infusion. Secondary outcomes included another scale for PTSD, the impact of event scale revised, and a a scale for depression, the MADRAS, Montgomery Asperger Depression Reading Scale. Mm-hmm. Patients, the, the bottom line is the patients in the ketamine group had significantly greater improvements in their PTSD symptoms and their depressive symptoms measured by the MADRAS from baseline to week two compared to the midazolam group, which is interesting. Midazolam, we know, is not really an effective antidepressant, for instance. This, now, this trial offered the first evidence of the efficacy of repeat ketamine infusions in reducing symptom severity in patients with PTSD. And I can tell you, I have a a friend, a woman whose husband had PTSD from military exposure, and he's been going to one of the IV ketamine clinics that's popping up all over for Mm -hmm. his PTSD. And he's had dramatic efficacy, sustained a dramatic efficacy, good tolerability. So that's excellent. So really this presents an opportunity here. We don't know if intranasal S ketamine has that same efficacy, which is Mm -hmm. You know, the S enantiomer 
uh, mm-hmm. we're seeing ketamine is composed of R ketamine and S ketamine. Mm-hmm. And the intranasal S ketamine, which is known as bravado, we know is approved for treatment resistant depression. Mm-hmm. So we just have to learn more. Right, right. And that will be exciting. What did we learn about social anxiety disorder and sleep disturbance? Because we know that there's been a, a large increase in social anxiety disorder, especially in the past couple of years with everything going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so it's interesting. We're really going through the whole DSM here, pretty much. We've talked about <laughs> mood, psychosis, substance abuse, PTSD, and now social anxiety, which is great. Mm-hmm. It's very mm-hmm. exciting that there are so many things going on in our field to help our patients. Mm-hmm. Well, something that's been known for a long time, like many of our psychiatric disorders, especially mood and anxiety disorders, social anxiety disorders associated with sleep disturbance. And that may interfere with learning and memory which is so important for exposure therapy treatment, which is one of the mainstays of the treatment of social anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. So a recent study looked at the relationship between exposure therapy outcomes and sleep disturbances in uh, patients who were getting exposure therapy sessions for uh, social anxiety disorder. And this was 152 patients. That's a pretty big study for an SAD study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Subjects participated in a five-week, 90-minute session per week group exposure therapy protocol that included treatment with placebo or decycloserine, which is interesting. That's a partial NMDA receptor uh, agonist shown to enhance exposure therapy outcomes for social anxiety disorder. Poorer self-reported baseline sleep quality was associated with slower social anxiety disorder symptom improvement over time and worse SAD outcomes. So participants who had higher mean levels of self-reported sleep time, so those who had more sleep time before the exposure sessions, had lower social anxiety disorder symptoms at the next session, suggesting better learning. Higher mean levels of post-session self-reported sleep time were related to lower SAD symptoms already at the last exposure session, suggesting better memory consolidation. Now, Self-reported pre- or post-session sleep quality was not associated with social anxiety disorder symptom outcomes, and d treatment did not moderate any of the effects of sleep on symptom outcomes. It was interesting. So these findings actually replicated earlier findings that poor baseline sleep quality is associated with worse exposure therapy outcomes in social anxiety disorder. And the study also showed that self-reported total sleep time the night before and after exposure therapy sessions is related to symptom change. So this is helpful information talking about assessing sleep difficulties in patients with social anxiety disorder, particularly the relationship with that and exposure therapy. So we want to try to improve the efficacy of exposure therapy. Now, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to talk about something else that is related to sleep quality. We're learning more and more that how important sleep is to our mental health and to our physical Mm -hmm. health. People with insomnia Mm -hmm. have higher rates of obesity and heart disease, for instance. Right, right. I want to focus on another study that was kind of controversial when it came out, and this is the association between sleep dysregulation and dementia. So... This was a study of almost 8,000 patients, over 7,900 patients, and they're looking at sleep duration and the incidence of dementia using a 25-year follow-up period. So they're following these patients for a long time. Mm -hmm. In this study, 521 cases of dementia were reported, and higher dementia risk was associated with a sleep duration of six hours or less at ages 50, 60, and 70 compared to people who slept seven hours or more. And this was a hazard ratio of 1.22, so about a a 22% increase. Sleep was considered short if, again, less than six hours or normal if seven hours and long if eight hours. Persistent short sleep at all age groups was associated with a 30% increased dementia risk independent of various other variables such as sociodemographic, behavioral, cardiometabolic, and mental health factors. So the results suggest that short sleep duration in midlife is associated with an increased risk of late-onset dementia, providing further evidence of the critical importance of having, in this case, seven hours or more of sleep or 
certainly more than six hours a night of sleep. <laughs> so that takes me to my final question, which is, do you have any last final news bits about psychopharmacology that you want to leave us with that happened this past year? I sure do. As I mentioned, this is a really exciting time. In the 28 years that I've been doing research <clears throat> with psychiatric medications, psychopharmacologic medications, this is one of the most exciting times as far as new innovation, new kinds of treatments, and the amount of money that's now going into research, especially private money, going into biotechs and pharmaceutical companies. I like to say that when I started my research career, it was really the dawn of the second era or the second wave of modern psychopharmacology. The, the, the first wave started in the 1950s with antidepressants such as monominox inhibitors and tricyclic antidepressants and the uh, typical or first generation antipsychotics. When I started my research career, this was the late 80s, early 90s, when we were starting to get the atypical antipsychotics. Of course, the first one being clozapine in 1988, 89 in this country. The next one, Risperidone, Risperdal in 1993. And of course, the SSRIs, Fluoxetine Prozac came out in, in 88 or 89 as well. Uh, so really the atypical antipsychotics, the SSRIs, which didn't necessarily improve on efficacy, but they certainly improved dramatically on, on safety and tolerability. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, though, these drugs, all, what all these drugs have in common is really working through the monoamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine predominantly. And so now we're really on the cusp of getting beyond monoamines and looking at medications that work on various other neurotransmitter systems. Now, the brain is so interconnected. You know, we talk about manipulating one neurotransmitter. We're, we're talking about manipulating others as well. And what we're probably mm -hmm. talking about is not simply there's too little serotonin in the brain or there's too much dopamine in the brain. We're talking about dysregulated circuits and we're talking about various ways to try to be a little more targeted in our targeting of circuitry and modulation of things in the brain. So mm -hmm. let me talk a little more about what I'm talking about here. There's a number of interesting things happening. We talked about medications that are FDA approved, but there's a number of medications being studied and some that have been submitted to the FDA for uh, approval and one such medication. Uh, there's a company called Sage Therapeutics that is partnered mm -hmm. with Biogen. Mm -hmm. They're developing a drug called Zoranolone, which is an oral neuroactive steroid that is a positive allosteric modulator of GABA-A receptors. They have re reported out positive studies for major depression, and they intend to submit and file with the FDA for approval sometimes. So that would be very exciting because wow. we're talking about a drug that really has a different mechanism of action. It's working on the GABA system, the GABA-A receptors. As I mentioned, most of our antidepressants work through the monoamines. We do now have ketamine and, and intranasal S-ketamine is actually FDA approved for treatment-resistant depression. So we know about mm -hmm. glutamate modulating drugs, but this would now be a GABA modulator. So that's certainly interesting. Wow. Yeah. Another medication that has been <clears throat> submitted to the FDA for approval is lumateparone or Caplita, which is, of course, currently approved for schizophrenia, but they have positive data for bipolar depression. And what's important here is they have data on both bipolar type 1 and bipolar type 2 depression, and they've submitted to the FDA. And their PDUFA date, the date when the FDA uh, rules on the approval, is actually in about a month from today. It's in mid-December of 2021. Mm -hmm. This would be exciting because there's only one other medication that's FDA approved for bipolar type 2 depression. That's quetiapine or Seroquel. Mm -hmm. We have four drugs currently FDA approved to treat bipolar depression, but only mm -hmm. the one is approved for bipolar type 2. So if lumateparone gets approved, it would be the fifth drug overall to treat bipolar depression and only the second approved for bipolar type 2. Wow. I mentioned earlier that Supernus has veloxazine extended release or Kelbri that was approved in April of this year for ADHD in children and adolescents. But as I mentioned, they also submitted to the FDA for the adult approval and their PDUFA date is April of 2022. Wow. Another important announcement, AbbVie announced their intention to submit to the FDA for the approval of Cariprazine or Vralar for augmentation for treatment of major depressive disorder. We have a couple of other atypicals that are approved for MDD, so this would be 
Another one, actually, there's only three right now approved. There's aripiprazole, brexpiprazole, and quetiapine. So this will be the fourth one approved. And that's very exciting, news, I think. Yeah. Uh, Cripperzine is already approved for bipolar depression, so it has an established antidepressant signal, if you will. <laughs> now, I need to also mention uh, a couple of medications that I think are very exciting that are in phase three and should be wrapping up their phase three program soon. Phase three is the phase of development where you get large multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled studies. They're called pivotal trials. Those the results of those studies are what is usually submitted for FDA approval. And there's two medicines in particular that are being studied as antipsychotics that are not dopamine receptor blockers. The first one is Eulotorant, which is a TAR-1 receptor agonist. TAR is trace amine-associated receptor 1. And the other one is called CAR-XT, which is Karuna's drug. It's a combination of xenomaline and trospium. This is an M1, M4, muscarinic cholinergic receptor 1 and 4 agonist. And uh, Eulotoron is a synovian drug. So these drugs mm-hmm. are, are finishing up their phase three programs in schizophrenia. And uh, we have a lot of high hopes for both of them. They showed very positive and interesting data in phase two. So hopefully uh, next year we'll hear more about those. Maybe they'll get submitted for approval next year. Now, yeah. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of kind of head scratchers by the FDA. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first one we talked about already was Aduhelm, Adumanicab, I can't say that very well, but at Aducanumab, sorry, Aduhelm, the, uh, the monoclonal antibody against beta amyloid. Uh, that was a head scratcher for some people that the FDA approved this drug. And what I didn't mention was the politics of this were interesting. The FDA's advisory panel, which the FDA usually takes their advice, they unanimously advised against approval of this drug, but the FDA went ahead and approved it anyway. And, and so that's some of the controversy. Two other head scratchers here included, the first one was pimavanserin or Nudexta, which had a very positive trial called the Harmony Study for dementia-related psychosis. Now, pimavanserin is already FDA approved for PDP, Parkinson's disease psychosis, but here it was being looked at for psychosis from any form of dementia, not just Alzheimer's dementia. And the company, Acadia, had pre-negotiated with the FDA that if we do this study, will you approve the drug? They said, yes. So they did this study. The study was actually stopped early because of an interim analysis showed such clear efficacy of pimavanserin that it wasn't fair to continue exposing people to placebo. They submitted it to the FDA and the FDA said, no, we're not going to approve your drug because the subpopulations with various types of dementia, especially the Alzheimer's subpopulation, didn't, wasn't significantly better than placebo. Well, mm-hmm. this was a complete misinterpretation of the study design. This study was not designed or, more importantly, powered to show significance for one type of dementia against placebo. It was designed and powered to show the whole dementia group versus placebo. Had they known the FDA was going to do this analysis, they would have continued the study and gotten more patients in each subgroup, particularly more patients with Alzheimer's. and that's called powering up or increasing power, and they would have, I'm sure, shown this. So this mm-hmm. is really unfortunate, especially because there's such a huge unmet need for this population. This is a medication, pimavanserin, that doesn't block D2 dopamine receptors. It's a 5-HT2A antagonist, predominantly with some 5-HT2C antagonism. So it's a very novel uh, kind of antipsychotic. And uh, the company, Acadia, is right now involved in negotiations with the FDA. Hopefully, they'll get them to reconsider. It is possible they might have to do a, another study, a new study. So we'll see what happens. But I think this really throws a little bit of cold water on companies right. uh, in negotiating with the FDA. Now, a second one that was a head scratcher was a company called Axome has developed a medication called AXS05. And it's mm-hmm. a combination pill of bupropion, which is known as Welbutrin, an antidepressant, and uh, dextromethorphan. And what's happening here is dex, so bupropion is a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Dextromethorphan has NMDA glutamate receptor antagonism, so kind of an oral form of ketamine, if you will, NMDA antagonism. It also has agonism at the sigma-1 receptor, 
which is potentially an antidepressant mechanism on its own, and it has some serotonin reuptake inhibition. Now, the problem is if you take dextromethorphan, like if you take, you know, Robitussin DM or cough syrup, you're actually not really getting dextromethorphan because dextromethorphan is very rapidly and virtually immediately converted, metabolized by CYP2D6 into an active metabolite called dextrorphan. Dextrorphan is a very potent NMDA antagonist, and that's probably what gives cough suppression and also what gives people a high when they abuse cough syrup. So <laughs> bupropion, in addition to being a complementary antidepressant mechanism, so a pharmacodynamic combination of adding two different mechanisms for depression, is also pharmacokinetically an, an inhibitor of CYP2D6. So by blocking the metabolism, you now have dextromethorphan hanging around with that unique receptor binding profile that predicts antidepressant efficacy. And Ax- Axome had very positive data for AXSO5 for the treatment of major depression, not necessarily surprisingly, with evidence of rapid onset of efficacy within the first week, potentially within the first four days. And this, again, would be an oral, rapid-acting antidepressant, sort of like an oral ketamine, if you will, although I'm certainly not saying it works as well as ketamine. Mm-hmm. And they submitted this data, which looked great. Everybody was expecting approval, and the PADUFA date earlier this year came and went, and the FDA issued them a warning saying that they had identified, quote, deficiencies in their application, and they didn't give details for several months, and this was a big mystery. People were really surprised by this and and really concerned. Finally, more recently, just a couple weeks ago, the FDA revealed the mystery and said, that they had found a couple of deficiencies in the analytic models used in their CMC process. CMC stands for Chemistry Manufacturing and Controls Process. So probably there was something going on with their manufacturing process, if you will, but not no concern about the efficacy or safety of the medication. So the hope here, usually situations like that can be rectified and dealt with within a matter of a few months. So our hope is that next year at some point, AXSO5 will be FDA approved to treat depression. And I think that would be also a really nice addition to our armamentarium. Absolutely. Wow. So it's been, as you can see, quite an exciting year with a lot going on. And hopefully Mm -hmm. I've given you a lot of foreshadowing into what could happen next year and the excitement that I'm certainly feeling at this stage in my career as we enter what I think is the third phase of modern psychopharmacology. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to mention one other thing, Sabrina, if I could, and that is sure. this has been sort of an annual recap, but for people to keep up with the latest, make sure as an NEI member, you can access a feature that we call This Month in Psychopharmacology. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And that's where we have summaries. We have the most current news updates on FDA approvals, neuroscience research, everything and anything that you need to stay on top of your clinical practice. So Dr. Cutler is absolutely right. That is a uh, benefit to being an NEI member. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Cutler, on this episode of the NEI podcast. And thank you all for listening. (laughs) Until next year. Thanks, everyone. Have a great holiday season. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. 